Welcome to Lithium Ion Rocks, Season 1, Episode 5, Crisis in Lithium Air Supply. It's March 2nd, and I'm publishing for Bull's Lair after 10 days in Florida and Mexico. In Florida, I had an opportunity to meet with a host of lithium CEOs at a time in which SQM, Oracobre, and Albemarle also reported their results. In addition to Rodney and me, you'll be hearing from The Price is Right Benchmark Minerals' Andrew Miller in an interview I conducted in Florida. You'll also be hearing from Tara Berry, Luke Kissam, Ricardo Ramos, and a Morgan Stanley and BMO analyst. Rodney will also discuss his note that he posted on LinkedIn asking the question, is the lithium chemical supply chain entering crisis mode? I tweeted a response, yes, and also wrote a note on Albemarle, Southern Accents, and the amazing Spider-Man in which I discuss their great operating results and strategy in joint venturing with mineral resources. Finally, Rodney and I will talk about Mr. Market Scoreboard with the first two months in and various news flow from Galaxy, Lithium Americas, Piedmont Lithium, Sigma, and others. I encourage all of you to visit our website, libull.com, and Rodney and me on Twitter and LinkedIn, at HowardKlein10 and at RodneyHooper13. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our Lithium Ion Bull newsletter at libull.com, where you can see every issue uh, over the past two and a half years, as well as every Lithium Ion Rocks podcast. The Morgan Stanley analyst was on the call, as was the BMO analyst, and both of them have been, in my mind, the biggest believers of SQM, uh, you know, production growth. And and they were a little bit kind of taken aback trying to understand why they're not increasing their production faster. The the Morgan Stanley guy was, uh, you know, his whole thesis, SQM is going to be the price setter. He's seen this in iodine. He's seen this in potash. And they are going to do whatever they can to maintain their market share. The next question comes from Javier Martinez with Morgan Stanley. Uh, You mentioned in the release that the demand, uh, you expect the demand to be growing more than 20%. And you say that your delivery uh, will be just slightly higher. So that that means that SQM will lose market share uh, in 2019, right? Market share is not my target volumes. Is my market in the long term? Margins is my mar- is my target in the long term. I, I don't care having 20% or 10% of the market share. It's not my, my target. It's not what I'm looking for. I'm, we're looking forward for margins. I'm looking forward for volumes. That's the one that we expect to have in the future. Joel Jackson with BMO Capital Markets. I had a, a few questions on lithium that are a little confusing. What is your current expected lithium production for 2019? We all thought it'd be about 70,000 tons. You said you will sell a bit less than 50,000 tons. You talk about inventory build. So how much inventory will you build, and how much will you produce in 2019? And if it's a lot less than 20, excuse me, if it's a lot less than 70,000 tons, can you let us know what's happening? Thank you. Let me try this again. Could you produce 70,000 tons this year if you want to, but you choose to produce a little bit more than 60 to balance the market in view of your, um, the new supply coming on? <laughs> Lower than anticipated production from key Chilean suppliers during 2018 provided a favorably timed opportunity to Chinese exporters. During 2018, Chinese producers grew market share of South Korea's carbonate and hydroxide imports by 21% and 15% respectively. While the lithium market continued to exhibit robust growth rates averaging 20% year-on-year, China's economic conditions added to softer market conditions. Uncertainty among China's battery chain regarding the imminent EV policy amendment and increased supply from Chinese producers moved the Chinese domestic price for both carbonate and hydroxide below the seaborne prices. As a result, A price arbitrage opened mid-2018, encouraging Chinese producers eager to shift inventory to the seaborne market. 
During the recent December quarter, China became a net exporter of lithium carbonate for the first time in over eight years. Lithium hydroxide producers in China were also impacted. Exports grew 75% quarter on quarter as hydroxide producers targeted seaborne markets manufacturing battery materials with, their, with a higher dependence on hydroxide. Chinese exporters targeted Asian markets, notably South Korea and Japan, capitalising on proximity of these markets relative to China, consistent robust demand growth and lower exposure to China's downstream electric vehicle market. The market is not short of recent examples demonstrating the challenges involved in adding lithium supply. The structure of the battery market in terms of current capacity provides rationale as to why the market retrieved to South Korea and Japan, while the Chinese market remained soft. With this geographic region currently accounting for almost a quarter of total global battery capacity. Shifting attention to 2023, and 2028, you can see that North America and European capacity is expected to grow share, while China largely retains its current proportion of the market, underpinned by easing of the Chinese government's policy on foreign investment and international car manufacturers' confidence in China's long-term prospects. Over 1,500 gigawatts of announced battery manufacturing capacity is expected by 2028, supporting robust demand growth. Oracobre maintains its long-term demand forecast in line with the consensus of other established lithium salt producers in the range of 17% to 20% CAGR between 2018 and 2025. A few weeks ago, I wrote uh, a short post responding to Wood McKenzie's forecast for uh, supply growth in 2019, put my own, which were far more conservative. And here we've had uh, the earnings season and uh, I've had to downgrade again. SQM, they are targeting a production and an inventory that was similar to my forecast, but they typically tend to uh, start in one place and backtrack from there. So adding it all up, uh, we're seeing that demand for this year is likely 55 to 60,000 tons. And this is an important theme. We've said it all year. Demand and now projections of uh, forecasted demand for 2025 out of all the major companies, uh, and in particular Albemarle, is now a million tons with the potential of an upward bias. And if we look at that, what, what that translates into in the earlier years coming immediately now, and what will happen post-2023 if battery costs can get down to $100 a kilowatt hour and lower, is that at 55 to 60 is going to grow 70 to 80, 100 and so on and going forward. And on the flip side of that, we're seeing supply stubbornly remain at a 10% to sub-20% growth each year. And that's not going to meet what is an expanding uh, a demand on the other side. So the question I raised is, are we in a lithium chemical supply crisis? And by that, I can go further and say in the subset of battery grade chemicals. And it looks to me that we are uh, likely in a, uh, in a in, in crisis mode because the demand is now agreed across the majors and growing uh, at a hell of a compound rate that I just don't see supply matching at the moment. And if demand is greater than supply, then prices will have to rise. But uh, they have been relatively high. They've been forecasted to fall, though, and this headwind of forecast has resulted in less investment, I think, than is necessary to meet this demand. Because we have to remember that a million tons of demand when people are putting their supply models together and they add up all of the announcements uh, of projects, uh, the projects generally aren't at 100% capacity. So if they're at 80% capacity, you need to be constructing and financing more than a million tons, probably at least you know 1.2, I would even argue to, to 1.4 million tons. 
And you've seen some significant investment and hats off to Albemarle for writing a big check on mineral resources and uh, pursuing uh, 50 plus 50 lithium hydroxide tons there on top of their investments with Greenbushes and Kemerton. You know, and Tangxi is investing there, although they're wasting $4 billion uh, on no new supply in SQM, in, in my judgment. You know, Ganfeng's made some investments, but the capital markets have not been friendly enough to the uh, juniors to get enough of these projects funded uh, you know, on time. You can't have oversupply without overinvestment, then the demand keeps increasing and there's not enough investment. Then the cure for that, I think, is higher prices, higher forecasted lithium prices. And once that starts penetrating the market as opposed to the air supply uh, headwinds that have dominated for the past year, you're going to see a more buoyant equity market for, uh, you know, lithium equities. If I could talk a bit more broadly uh, supporting that, you've seen in the U.S. Uh, December's, you know, fall in the markets has uh, turned around very sharply, but sector specific, you know, industrial stocks, um, material stocks, small cap growth stocks have all been in favor and outperforming, and that bodes well for lithium stocks. And it's reflected in the Mr. Market scoreboard, which I put in my most recent lithium bull today, uh, shows companies like Albemarle are up 20%, you know, Ganfeng's up 20%, or Cobra's up 20%. So the, the, the it's happening, and volumes are increasing. There have been some stocks, you know, Millennial Lithium has gone on a, a very big run. We saw Ioneer was up 15% overnight. Uh, and there have been other companies like that. Piedmont, Neolithium, Advantage are all up 20% plus. Uh, even Standard Lithium was up 10%. They hit the bid on a $10 million bought deal, about 15% down and uh, with a half warrant at, uh, you know, for three years, you know, the half warrant up 30%. Mineral resource is a bit of a mystery for me. Uh, they're flat on two months, but uh, they've been fairly volatile. We got to look into that. There is some iron ore noise in there. There's also uh, decreased EBITDA, you know, for next year, given their capital investment with Albemarle, but, uh, you know, still trading at very low multiple and high dividend yield. And uh, especially if you anticipate a billion dollars coming to their coffers later this year from Albemarle. One of our peers, Masterminds, uh, wrote a very good note as well, saying the second coming of lithium, which I retweeted uh, agreeing mostly with. He was calling for Q3, Q4 turnaround. Uh, I suggested it might already be underway. In the past, I think you know, I, I, I've said that 2019, uh, I think, could be like Prince's 1999, you know, internet bubble times. I still think that that's a possibility. It, we're in the third year of a presidential election, which also historically has been good for markets. So that's my uh, soapbox uh, broader market you know, bull to underpin my lithium bull persona. Lithium delivered 19% year over year adjusted EBITDA growth in 2018. And our major capital investments in lithium remain on track to ensure that growth continues well into the future. We addressed some debottlenecks at Lenegra 2 during the year and were able to operate near nameplate rates by year end. In 2019, we expect to produce close to 40,000 metric tons of lithium carbonate in Lenegra in spite of the significant rain event in the Solar de Atacama in January and February of this year that will cost us about 3,000 metric tons of production in 2019, all of which will occur in the first half. Lenegra 3 and 4, which will increase lithium carbonate capacity in Chile to a total of 85,000 metric tons, remains on track to begin commissioning in 2020. In Zinyu, China, we achieved mechanical completion and started commissioning activities of the 20,000 metric ton lithium hydroxide expansion, taking our total China capacity to 35,000 metric tons annually. Earlier this year, we shipped battery grade qualification samples from Zinyu, and that team has exceeded each commissioning milestone to date. While it's still early, 
we expect this site to meet its production goals for 2019. In January, we began the site work related to the lithium hydroxide complex in Kimmerton, Western Australia. This complex, which should be the largest lithium hydroxide complex in the world when fully built out, will use spodumene concentrate from Tallison as a feedstock. The first phase of the complex will be three trains of 20 to 25,000 metric tons capacity each with the ability to add two additional trains over time if market demands require such additional capacity. The commissioning of this site is expected to start in stages during the second half of 2021 and continuing into 2022. Finally, the expansion of Tallison, our spodumene joint venture in Greenbushes, Australia, remains on schedule to be commissioned in the second quarter of 2019. That expansion will result in a total production of about 160,000 metric tons on an LCE full-year run rate basis, with Albemarle's annual share being 80,000 metric tons on an LCE basis. Albemarle, you know, had a strong call. They came through with uh, strong numbers. I'm not sure that I would completely agree with uh, what their estimates are for supply growth for the year, but they've come off a very low price base from their contract, uh, contracted supply, and that's I would I would agree that they are going to see improved prices uh, throughout this year. But uh, again, the big showing really was when they disclosed their uh, demand numbers and uh, with an upward bias with potential to go as high as 1.3 million tons by 2025. So, you know, as far as uh, customer feedback and customer interaction, I do, I do rate uh, Albemarle. Howard, what do you think? Albemarle has had a lot of attitudinal headwinds. The discourse about Albemarle has been on balance negative in, in similar ways that it's negative Tesla. If you look at their results, I think they had like nine straight quarters of EBITDA growth. They, they haven't missed a beat. You know, this is a quality company. They have the bromine in their catalyst business, which are mature, cash flowing. Uh, uh, an interesting comment that uh, Luke Kissam made was that the bromine business is a high correlated to GDP business, and they're seeing no weakness in there. So to the extent that bromine's a leading indicator for slower or, or rising you know, GDP growth, uh, it, it's a reflection that GDP is good, right? Because that, that's okay. But I think they've been very smart. Uh, I mean, the, the, the bromine and the catalyst business under help underpin an investment grade credit rating. That investment grade credit rating is essential for you know a billion dollar bond issue that they're going to do later this year to fund their purchase of mineral resources. So. Uh, you know, whereas uh, I'm a big fan of Livent and the Pure Play and the Spin Out, but uh, Livent will be a, a, a more volatile stock as a Pure Play, uh, whereas the bromine and catalyst business lends some support to the volatility of, of Albemarle share while also making it a, a bigger and more liquid company to trade. I believe it does trade primarily as a lithium stock and a lithium proxy. Uh, those interested in uh, playing lithium, it, it, it's the it, from America. Uh, it, it's the them and lit really the lit uh, from a, a diversification perspective. You could look at lit and say half of their business is in Tesla and and Panasonic, and the other half are in a diversified you know mix of companies, uh, lithium companies. In uh, Albemarle, you have you know fifty plus percent in lithium, and then fifty percent, you know, in these other businesses, which are financing the lithium growth. So, you know, I like what I hear and see. And uh, for all the naysayers about, you know, oh, maybe they overpaid for mineral resources, I, I look back at the Rockwood acquisition when similar things were, were, were said. And to those who are lamenting, where is the investment in the industry? Uh, they've been aggressive. This is an aggressive investment in new production following their customers, who, which in particular Korean and Japanese, reliable, credit worthy, um, you know, so and their pricing strategy has been smart. You know, those saying, oh, you know, Albemarle was 
not getting as high a price as SQM. SQM basically said in their call that they're very much looking at fixed price contracts as well. And it's important to, to recognize again this, this point that SQM largely is not a player in the battery grade hydroxide market. They've historically been in carbonate across the board in carbonate products, but uh, increasingly they've gotten a very high price, 15,900 uh, is down from 16,500 last quarter but still a significant premium. Uh, I think they've upgraded uh, more of their, you know, lubricant, uh, you know, grease, you know, ceramic um, type uh, applications and, and said we're going to sell it to the battery grade carbonate market. But again, they're not a major player in the hydroxide market. I think Livent and Albemarle, who are bigger players in the hydroxide market, have underpinned their hydroxide investments with that. And I think th this movement that SQM is talking about to fixed rate prices uh, or price floors, uh, you, you know, might be for their, you know, Australia, uh, you know, hydroxide tons. Uh, so it, 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 it's interesting. I mean, it, it having long term contracts at Albemarle and Livent ensures greater visibility and predictability of earnings. And that, we've talked about this before, translates into a higher multiple. I think SQM, like Ganfeng, deserves uh, substantial discounts to Albemarle and Livent uh, because they are emerging market stocks. They just don't speak to investors in the way that Albemarle and, and Livent do. I was disappointed in a lot of what I heard from Ricardo Ramos. We're only going to sell 50,000, but we're going to produce 60,000. So we're going to keep 10,000 tons in inventory. We're Saudi Arabia, and we're going to be the, we're the swing supplier. I, I just don't buy that, quite frankly. You can question whether or not they'll actually reach that production, but I do think that there is merit in in having inventory waiting for what is a boom and bust industry to have another boom and being able to sell at a premium. If we do see a follow through in demand and we do have a, a period of slight undersupply in the battery grade market, then SQM could well fetch itself a, a handsome price for that. But, you know, it would be fair to ask the question of whether or not they'll actually achieve that production level. The other thing that I just find Incredible is that Morgan Stanley is still at 641,000 tons of estimated demand to 2025. And I think it's important that they, they have a review and start to concede because the biggest players in the industry who, mo who know more than all the rest of us are saying a million tons plus. A lot of the price forecasters by the sell side, no one has forecasts higher than ten dollars or $11,000 long term. But when I looked at the Mineral Resources joint venture by Albemarle, uh, the implicit price assumed in order for them to get two times their cost of capital and assuming their 45% EBITDA margin, this is in the Pilbara. So it's relatively remote and it's relatively lower grade. So I think this is a second, third quartile uh, operating cost. So I'm uh, assuming a $6,000 kind of operating cost and a 45 EBITDA margin implies something like a $13,000 hydroxide price long term for Albemarle in order to get a 15 to 20% return. I think you did some calculations. You think it may be 14,000, but but thereabouts, the, the analyst community has not upgraded their medium term forecasts for that. And I think they're wrong that Albemarle knows a lot better than any one of these analysts who can't see the demand and certainly d don't have as good a sense of supply. You can have a demand number that looks outrageous relative to supply. The OEMs need to actually commit, make the orders, which then triggers the, the battery manufacturers, which then triggers further upstream. At the moment, the forecasts are based on the penetration, etc., but we haven't seen you know, the final firm orders and the development of um, of the of the you know the mega factories coming through in in their in their final stages and i think that is what's going to actually trigger the reality of there is a problem on the supplier side and now my interview with benchmark minerals andy miller down in florida first thing uh, i'd like to talk about is there's a lot of spodumene producers that have feasibility studies out there with 
certain prices in there, and now they're wondering with the price fall, what is the appropriate price that you would recommend they put into their model for, let's call it the 2020 to 2025 period? And we're now seeing prices largely in the you know the 650 to 700, 700 slightly above uh, type of range at the moment. There could be a bit more to come off of that um, in the coming months. So we're not going sub 600. And when you're talking about, especially for, like you say, SC6, you're talking about a 6% material, um, you've got to take into account that not everything that's reaching the market at the moment is that quality. Um, so there's a differential in pricing, and there's, there's certainly some very discounted lots being offered for for some uh, lower purity material. Um, but if you talk about a 6%, which is what people are converging towards and what the, the converters um, ideally would like to use, then we're looking in that uh, 650 to, to slightly over 700 type of range. And that's for that five-year period, or was that a more specific, you know, this year? I think you're going to see some volatility, but I really think, you know, the, the, the new normal for spodumene pricing is going to be in the 600 to 700 range. I don't think we're really going to go back to the prices of last year in the as I say, 800, 900s. There's a lot of rain in South America. I've read some analyst research saying there may be a 10% reduction or so from South American supply of carbonate, uh, depending on the conversion of hard rock in China to carbonate, the oversupply of spodumene may be absorbed faster than some of the people in the market expect as a result of these rains. Do, do you have any thoughts on that? When you talk about the overall lithium units, you're going to have you can have some reduction in the chemical production from the South American producers in the first half of the year. Um, and I think that will uh, eat into some of the, the potential oversupply from spodumene production in China. And another phenomenon that we're seeing is uh, China has become a major exporter to Japan and Korea of hydroxide. Always thought like what goes to China kind of stays in China for the Chinese market. The Japanese and the Korean battery producers, they're still the market leaders, um, especially when you're talking about quality batteries and batteries for the electric vehicle market in particular. So the demand's there. China will become a big supplier to the rest of the world as well as its own domestic market. Domestically, they have huge battery expansions taking place. The higher value applications, um, the, the Panasonics, the Samsungs, the LG Chems of the world are still the leaders in that field, really. Um, so the demand growth will, will come from their, their plants in those areas, as well as their new plants in North America, Europe, China as well, um, of course. So um, you're going to see you know, more volumes. China's going to become an increasingly important part of the hydroxide um, picture. I think what's interesting in the short term, especially, and seeing what happened last year, is you started to see um, meaningful volumes of, of carbonate uh, come out of China. Now, not all of that was battery grade and going into battery applications, um, but that's certainly what the, you know, the tier one and tier two producers, uh, converters, sorry, in China are targeting. So um, I'd expect to see some more um, higher quality lithium carbonate as well, potentially start coming out of China into those markets. The premium uh, of hydroxide to carbonate has been, uh, you know, much debated. What are you guys forecasting? We're certainly expecting there to be some tightening in the price differential between a lithium carbonate and a lithium hydroxide over the next couple of years. Um, in our models, you know, we've always said, um, when you look at these high nickel cathode chemistries, we're really expecting those post 2022, 2023 sort of time frame before you start to see some real um, widespread penetration of those type of cathode chemistries. So uh, for those reasons, I think, you know, there, there was going to have to be a correction in the hydroxide price, especially where you were last year compared to carbonate. There was such a, a high premium that wasn't really justified in the market. I think that will, that correction is going to continue into this year. You're already starting to see a bit of that pressure and I expect to see that continue. Um, and like I said, over the next couple of years, we do think that price will narrow. Where things go post that is, you know, will really be driven, you know, by how quickly that switch to the higher nickel cathodes happens and, and how, how quickly that demand ramp up in, in hydroxide plays out. I've looked at a number of feasibility studies and most are using 12, 13,000 for a battery grade carbonate. And typically they're putting in like two to $3,000 premium for hydroxide. And we don't see carbonate prices falling to below 10. This year there's the potential, again, that you might see a little bit more softening out in the carbonate price. Um, but but not a huge amount. I think where we are today, outside of China, 
um, in the sort of 12 to 13 range, where, where carbonate will be for the majority of this year. You know, we have hydroxide outside of China still for battery grade, still, you know, the 16 plus sort of level. Um, I could see that coming down a, a little bit further and narrowing on, on carbonate. China seems very capital constrained. Companies like General Lithium have been mooted to raise capital via an IPO. There's, there's Yawa, there's Rufu. Could you give us any insight to the speed with which these other converters are going to come on stream and, and, and what will catalyze it to happen quicker? in the high price of 2017 um, and all the interest you saw and all the statements made about new conversion capacity that's going to be installed for spodumene um, a lot of that hasn't played out and has stalled for this year the Gamfeng and Changchis of, of, of the world that have been that are very open about their expansion targets and when you get to those sort of tier two uh, converters the Ahua, Rufu, um, they may be that they're a bit delayed on where they said they would be but we are starting to see some of that that conversion capacity come into the market um, you know general lithium obviously have their their new facility up and running now um, Rufu, i believe is targeting uh, early q2 to start commissioning a new plant yahua i think is at the end of q2 was their latest um, sort of timeline for their new plant so you have a, a way of these new tier two producers that are coming in and I think will be successful in bringing new capacity on. I think the question you really have to ask then is how quickly will that ramp up happen? And, you know, are we, are we going to see substantial volume second half of this year? Will it take into, into 2020 before you start to see some of that play out? Um, and the second part, you know, which is also crucial for both those producers, but also all the majors as well at the moment is, when you bring in that new conversion capacity or, or new, new chemical capacity, um, how much of it's going to be up to battery spec and how, how quickly can you get that consistency and, and uh, quality uh, right to supply the battery market. So that's another thing I think has to be taken into, into account. Well, the demand numbers, Tesla announced their mass market $35,000 price. I saw SK Innovation is you know, increasing uh, the size of their plant in, in Hungary. I think Tesla is talking now about a $2 billion bond for their Shanghai facility. I mean, the, the, the announcements are, are coming so thick and fast, it's hard to um, keep on top of them all. But they've, they've Albemarle... SQM, all these guys are obviously digesting all of these numbers and it's feeding into their, you know, now you say it, it's consensus, you know, a million tons. Just a year or two years ago, SQM was forecasting 600,000. So it's a, a huge increase. Uh, going back a little bit to SQM, they keep saying they're, they're approved for 70,000 tons. They, they keep saying, okay, and then we're going to go to 120 and then we're going to go to 180. But, um, you know, the, their new water guy, Dr. Christie, who was supposed to come up with a report at the end of December, still hasn't come up with anything. Water is a real issue. Environmental approval of that expansion from 70 to 120 and then to 180 is not a done deal. And the $450 million that they're saying it's going to cost them to kind of grow that I, I, I'm very suspicious of the, the, if you look at, I think it's BHP and, and some of the others in the Atacama, water is a real issue. They have, they're using desalination plants for a lot. So if SQM were forced to build a desalination plant, you know, their $4,000 a ton capital intensity estimate is going to be a lot higher. No one's talking about this in, in any meaningful way, and I'm not suggesting they're going to have to do this, but water is, you know, is very conspicuous by its absence in the SQM call, as was any commentary on, you know, Tang Shi now being on the board, and, and there was zero commentary at all on their most major expansion, you know, with, with Kidman. So, uh, SQM remains a very risky emerging market, uh, you know, influenced stock and a reason that it's not on, you know, our, our baker's dozen, or at least my baker's dozen, kind of go green. Much prefer Albemarle and Livent uh, and Ganfeng as ways to play this space. Although on Ganfeng, I have to say, it's now March 1st. They came out with you know, a profit warning uh, at the end of January, and then they came out with preliminary results yesterday, but their final, final results are not coming out until quite late, late in March. The profit warning 
was in part due to a mark to market uh, their equity investments in companies like Pilbara and Lack, which have fallen significantly. It's not a cash hit; it's just a to stock hit. But uh, the other numbers that they showed, uh, uh, you know, they showed a decrease. The sales were increasing, but I think decreased operating margins. So we'll see what what's going to happen there. We, I, I was always expecting Q3 and Q4 to be not so great because of you know high purchase prices from Mount Marion, Spodumin, uh before you know this year's growth of carbonated hydroxide. I think you feel the same. So this is a short-term hit, not a big deal. We've also seen some trading dynamic in the Shenzhen listed shares. Uh, you know, whenever there's a trade deal uh, expectation, uh, there's enthusiasm, but we, we saw very sharp rises. Uh, you know, there's one day both Tangxi and Ganfeng were up like 9% after uh, the positive comments from both Xi Jinping and and Trump. So there's always, a, you, you know, scope for speculation, uh, you know, for Chinese speculation influencing the valuation of, you know, Ganfeng's share. Another dynamic at play in the Chinese equity market is that MSCI has changed its index weightings to include more Shanghai and Shenzhen listed companies. The, the allocation in these indexes has quadrupled and as a result anyone benchmarked to those indexes will allocate additional capital to these shares i'm not sure if ganfeng or tangxi are in any of these indexes i want to look that up but uh, broadly if there's more money hitting the shenzhen stock market even if they're not in those indexes they may rise in sympathy so there could be some technical trading factors influencing, you know, Ganfeng and, and Tangxi shares. But uh, as we've said before, um, I, I think from a, a Western mind perspective, I'd like to see uh, kind of detailed MD&A, you know, coming from Ganfeng. I'd like to see the transparency of like how much, you know, how many carbonate tons are they selling? How many hydroxide tons are they selling? What price are they getting? You know, what kind of commentary, market commentary? Are they going to do conference calls? I mean, I, I don't expect them to be of the standard of a live end or an album all yet, but um, if they could aspire to be, at least have the transparency of, a, of an SQM, uh, you know, an, an interface with investors like myself and other institutions, they, they should strive for that. But I've seen no indication that they're planning to have a conference call. Um, their website is still, you know, an abomination, in my opinion. You go and try to find a press release on their website, and, and, and there's none listed. You have to go to the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. So um, I'm a little bit disappointed that, that Ganfeng should have been kind of more ready to be a public company for English language uh, shareholders in, you know, the non-Chinese, you know, world. If they're going to be a player and, and and want the same kind of, you know, rating, but that's part of my upside thesis, and I think your upside thesis to Ganfeng that those things are easier to do than, uh, you know, fix, um, you know, operational performance in, in, in lithium chemical production, which everyone I speak to says that they certainly are, you know, fantastic. And, uh, you know, I have great faith in that. I haven't seen that directly. It's all kind of secondhand, but uh, I believe it. But I'd really like to see them do some of these easier things um, because otherwise their valuation will be stuck in a kind of lost in translation discount. Let's go to some other news. Galaxy finalized with Posco. Namaska announced strategic alternative appointment of you know, Clarkson's Plateau, the, the group that led lead managed their bond deal last year. Lack had an operational update. Altura had an upbeat comment on you know their getting to nameplate. Sigma announced a water license and some tax exemptions in Brazil. Piedmont had a 32% increase in their acreage in the historic Carolina Tin Spodumane Belt, 1,824 acres. This follows some of the best drill results uh, that they announced a bit earlier this year.
Yeah, the Galaxy was interesting in that uh, there's quite a big tax liability for the payment. If you look at the value of that uh, tax deduction of the settlement by POSCO, I think it translates into more than 10% of Galaxy's market cap. So that 280 was not 280, it was more like what? 185 or something. The Altium, it's good to hear that they're getting towards nameplate. Uh, I'm sure with Primero's help, they'll be producing uh, SE6 or better. And uh, with low impurities, they certainly, when I last had a conversation with them, were well below the iron and mica cutoffs. So that's uh, positive to hear. Uh, the Namaska, oh, it's an interesting one, I think. Uh, you tell me, it's almost like they're handing their future over to some special committee. I mean, Clarkson's uh, is a Nordic group. They did do a Nordic bond. So I think the bondholders are obviously concerned. But uh, Guy was relatively upbeat, you know, having spoken to his existing shareholders. Um, I wish Namaska well. Again, I think the market needs... Um, you know, quality projects and quality tons. Uh, but right now there is, there's a bit of a headwind. Namaska stock actually performed very well for a couple of days last week. So going back to what we said earlier, there, there has been, there's interest reemerging in the sector. There is volume in a lot of these stocks. Watching the volume, which is increasing, you know, if it's sustainable, bearishness that others have kind of talked about, at the outset of this year, I, I see as a contrarian indicator, I'm, I'm, I'm very bullish this year, and I'm, and I'm quite bullish that it could happen a lot sooner. So remember, volatility is one of the words I, I use quite a bit. I was shocked at how fast things fell last year, uh, and a, a 180 upside uh, um, volatility is also, is also possible. I caught up uh, with one of your favorites, uh, Lithium Power. Um, Richard Crooks is, is someone I've known for a while. He's the new kind of you know corporate finance uh, director, um, helping to, to finance that project, and and, and got a, a pretty good perspective on the private side of Chile. Um, and you know, and, and that project, I, I hadn't realized that other than Sol de Vida. Uh, lithium power is the most advanced pro project. You know, it's at definitive feasibility study. All the other Argentine companies, they're, they're just at PA level or at, at PFS level. You know, when I spoke to the CEO and the chairman of, of MSB, the JV, you know, it was very clear the CapEx estimates used in the definitive feasibility are firm live pricing. They've completed a definitive feasibility. They are clear to go. They're waiting for a COL on the um, a permit on the new code land on the Litio land, but uh, and their environmental impact assessment. They never had any issues in the first 40 days. Just some queries. So, you know, once they receive those, they can like lack. If they can find a funder, they can proceed to production. Yeah, and it is Chile, and it's the private side of Chile, so they're not subject to any of the royalties that Albemarle and uh, SQM are subject to. I've had a great preference for plain vanilla hard rock over the brines, but uh, as you said in your most recent note, th this whole uh, hard rock versus brines debate uh, we should put that all aside. The industry needs to fund a lot more projects, and they will need as much hard rock and as much brines, and viable projects need to get funded. I understand the appeal of hard rock when you look at the case of Pilbara from first drilling to production in four years. That's exceptional, and it cannot be done in brine. The reality is that, uh, as I've mentioned, is as we get out to you know, 2024, 2025, the growth in demand at that point in time, you know, at 2025 going forward is 200,000 tons. You know, one has to, <laughs> that is more than four times what's coming online in 2019 for, from everywhere, from every source. So whilst it is appealing from the hard rock perspective to having a shorter route to production of spodium and concentrate, what we're seeing is there's still a lot of work to be done from the converters 
to match the supply of the spodium and con uh, concentrate coming online and to get that to a battery grade product. And that is really the, the, the key issue here is, are these independent converters outside of the Ganfen and Tangshi going to be able to produce a battery grade product that qualifies outside of China? Because China is all the rage now. Yes, they sell more than half of EVs globally in China, but that is going to change in time as America, Europe, etc., accelerates into you know the EV world. Eric Norris of Albemarle, I, I wrote about this in my note, uh, made a comment on the call that how he sees the market evolving. It's it's the, the five majors who can produce the battery grade hydroxide and carbonate that are where most of the supply is going to come from. And this doesn't mean that they're the only companies that are going to do it. There's plenty of room for juniors, quality juniors, to realize enormous amounts of value and ultimately uh, partner or be bought by these five majors. The majors don't have 10 years to do the exploration and wait. They don't have the time. That's right. So like a pharmaceutical company that uh, buys a, a biotech company that goes from, you know, a phase one to phase two to phase three, you know, FDA approval, you get to a scoping study and then a pre-feasibility study and then a definitive feasibility study and you demonstrate you have a real project, you know, you, you get bought by those. But ultimately, you know, it's playing into their hands because projects that are advancing and progressing are still trading at substantially discounted valuations. Crazy valuations. So I, I would love to see, look, I, I'm, I'm afraid in some cases, because I've invested in a number of the juniors of them getting picked off at too low a valuation. Certain pharmaceutical companies, you know, partner uh, early on with promising developing companies. Other wait until, you know, they find, you know, they get that FDA approval and, and then buy it for a billion dollars, right? That, that seems to have been kind of Albemarle's uh, philosophy, that they wait and, and then, um, and then they, they spend big dollars. Ganfeng has been partnering, you know, kind of earlier, uh, you know, might Albemarle or Livent, you know, partner um, earlier. My uh, conversation with uh, Ken Brinsden at Pilbara, all, all the hydroxide chemical plants being built in Western Australia and, and the concept of, you know, it being important to have facilities close to mine mouth. And he was saying, you know, everyone talks their own book and he's not doing that, you know, here and he's advancing discussions with, with POSCO on a hydroxide, you know, in Korea. He was making the argument that the cost of shipping spodumene six percent somewhere from Western Australia is is far less of a consideration than all the other components that go into uh, making hydroxide. So reagent cost, electricity costs, um, labor costs, and in addition, like hydroxide, you can't store hydroxide for long periods of time. So six months, a year, it needs to be used. So if it's sitting in Australia uh, and you have some just-in-time production process with a cathode maker, um, you know, there's some distance it has to travel from Australia. It's not, it's not terrible, but having a hydroxide chemical facility close to cathode production is probably more important than having it close to mine mouth was was his arguments two things about live and one it's march 1st so the full spin-off is taking place today um the lit etf you know fmc is that one of their biggest holdings they're going to be selling all of that at some stage i would expect soon it's curious to see what the um live and waiting is but uh there's been a lot of i think they also were added to a small cap index so live and shares have been trading not so much on fundamentals, uh, and, and there could be some opportunity there, but vis-a-vis -vis juniors, they are in arbitration now with, uh, you know, Namaska. Um, they could have just taken their $20 million, you know, $10 million what they invested plus $10 million penalty. You know, might Livent step into Namaska? It doesn't seem so given the, the, the tenor of their current conversations, but you know, why not? Why wouldn't Livent partner with some other companies 
that are trading at very low valuations now uh, because their their plan just to expand in Argentina is not is going to result in lost market share if they uh, they may or may not care about it. Maybe they have Ricardo Ramos's uh, attitude that we're just focused on margin. I don't believe so. I think with the full spin-off now in effect, you know, beginning <laughs> on Monday, it's not just Philadelphia freedom. It's it's now in a full, you know, emancipation to be seen, but if I were a corporate finance guy at any one of these major companies looking at these small you know there's good quality projects trading at very deep discounted valuations and i don't think that's going to last for that long uh because of all of the reasons we were talking about earlier the sentiment is improving and i'd like to end now with a long distance dedication to all my friends in the big chili corfo sqm Morgan Stanley, and other brokers who believe all of the SQM supply lines and develop short lithium stories. This is a 10-year megatrend, if not longer. In Lithium Ion Rocks, Lithium Ion Bull, and through our respective LinkedIn and Twitter posts, Rodney and I may share with our audience some rationale for a stock for which we have conviction, to own or not to own. If you agree or disagree with and act on or against the rationale of anything said or written in this or any other lithium ion rocks or lithium ion bull, that's your free choice. But to be clear, what you are listening to or reading is not investment advice and may not be unbiased. It should not be construed as an investment recommendation to buy or sell any security. Rodney and I are not registered investment advisors nor broker dealers. Please visit libull.com for further disclaimers.